From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you, and here's what's ahead. From Iowa State University, Lee Schultz sizes up the cattle market trends. Lee will comment on the latest slaughter weight numbers as an indicator of the backlog of market-ready cattle. And he will talk about the increasing pace of beef slaughter as the industry recovers from the COVID-19 situation. Then K-State's Greg Hanselcheck is back to talk about additional cattle herds in Kansas testing positive for trichomoniasis. He'll look at the options and the protocols for keeping it from entering a breeding herd. And on this week's 4-H segment with Jeff Wickman, K-State's Beth Hinshaw will discuss 4-H campference taking place virtually later this month. All this and more next on Agriculture Today. While many people know hunger is an issue in developing countries, it is also a problem in our own backyards. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table. Two K-State research and extension programs are tackling this problem. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reach thousands of Kansans in more than 70 counties. They learn how to eat healthy with a low budget. For more information about these programs, visit ksre.ksu.edu. Welcome aboard for another Agriculture Today on the K-State Radio Network. For openers on this Monday edition, it's to the cattle markets and comments this time from livestock economist Lee Schultz of Iowa State University. He's with us regularly here as part of our livestock economist rotation. Well, to the markets last week, Lee, the cash trade seemed to be trending lower by and large. So it does beg the question now, has the recovery in prices, to put it this way, topped out for the early summer period? That's a great question. You know, I think we're really taking this week to week, it it seems to me. And and really, we're looking at slaughter levels and and how that's impacting both box beef prices and, and fed cattle prices. Earlier in the week, we had fairly strong cash prices, I, I guess, putting it in perspective. Uh, we've seen trades anywhere from 109 to 117. Uh, and then by late in the week, we were 5 to $12 lower than that. Uh, we've really seen basis converge here, um, where we had been running basis levels historically high um, anywhere here in Iowa. I mean, we're almost upwards of $20 over the board. Um, that speaks to the strength in cash prices relative to futures prices. Uh, but we've both we've seen both uh, futures prices and cash prices really decline here th- this last week. And so, you know, I think we're, we're really in that, that holding pattern now. Hopefully we don't see any further declines and looking for a, a rebound. One market that has seen some strength, uh, to be quite honest, it was bit lower this week when we looked out on futures, but cash feeder cattle have been fairly strong. Um, Really, I think we're seeing some pretty strong demand, a lot of pent-up demand that we had in March and April, seeing a lot of the the auctions opening back up. We're bringing uh, cattle to town with these higher prices, and, and we've seen some strength there, which is, I think, really put a floor on feeder cattle prices. I want to speak briefly to this, though we once again, for what, the third consecutive week at least, have seen this wide gap in the cash-fed bids, as much as 8 9 $10. This persists. What's at the root of that, Lee? Well, I think that's really an artifact of, of the current situation. So one, it's we, we know that there's, there's multiple operational levels out there by packing plants, so that's given us a, a range in, in those values as, as some plants you know, maybe caught short because they increase operational levels relative to the cattle that they have committed and and they start to bid up and and we see some higher prices there. Also, you know, we've seen some some reductions in plants that had been operating at a bit higher levels. And so that, you know, when when that situation happens, the the bids decline. So I think in a situation like this, it, it may be expected that you're seeing some wide bids in there not only from a you know, day-to-day standpoint, but just even across a packers, as, as we've kind of seen over the last couple of weeks. I think what we know is, though, as this situation improves and we increase that packing capacity, we should start to see those bids tighten up a bit. 
and just from the fact that we'll have some more certainty um, in understanding what the supplies are relative to the shackle space availability. And just to follow up on that, where are we with Packer Processing Pace? Uh, have the problems largely cleared up now? Uh, are we seeing these plants operate at a, a new capacity that'll be the norm from here forward with the COVID precautions now in place? What's going on, Lee? All great questions. If we look at this last week, uh, we were compared to year ago levels, which has been really used as the benchmark. We're four to five percent below year ago levels. So that's market improvement from the lows that we had seen back in, in the first week of, of May. But we've over the last eight weeks developed a backlog of cattle of roughly 1.1 million head of cattle. Uh, so being below year ago levels suggests we're not even eating into that backlog of cattle. Hmm. Um, that doesn't mean that we're not targeting the heaviest cattle out there and trying to bring those to market. And so we don't see weights really get, get much larger, but we continue to really add to that backlog or at least not work into that backlog. Um, as far as, you know, what the new processing capacity is, I've heard numbers anywhere from 10% below the targeted rate to 15 or maybe 5%. Really, I think that's speculative at this point. I think the, the physical infrastructure, the changes we've made in those plants, ingenuity would prevail. I think we would figure out a way to get back up to operational capacity. What it comes down to is the labor constraint. Um, and that's really what brought us into this situation. And that's certainly what's going to bring us out of this situation. So if we can ramp up these plants bringing back the labor force fully, being able to operate at rather strong Saturday kills will be very important to getting back up to the operational capacity that we need to really work through these heavy cattle supplies over the next couple of months. All right. And you touched upon this, but just for clarity, have we seen slaughter weights slow down in their escalation? Uh, is that starting to level off? We're starting to see it level off from a week-to-week -week standpoint, but certainly when you look at where we're at relative to year-ago levels, those weights are dramatically larger. Uh, I follow the Iowa-Minnesota series because that's where I'm at, and it is important to note that we have some of the heaviest weights here nationally, but those weights are, on a live weight basis, 71 pounds heavier than a year ago. Uh, same week a year ago. So the weights are largest for negotiated cattle. Uh, there we're, we're over 1,500 pounds on a live weight basis. Uh, on a carcass delivered, you're at 945 for, for uh, dressed weight. So the, these are big carcasses that, you know, we're going to continue to need to work through over the next couple of months. I think we've at least seen them steady here from the big spikes that we've seen in, in May. Uh, but this will be a situation that we're going to have to continue to worry about, um, especially as we're entering some summer days here that are getting rather hot, right? And so <laughs> uh, heavy cattle and hot weather, that, that isn't a good mix. And so we need to continue to monitor those cattle and continue to target those cattle uh, to get those uh, moved off the farm. Well, let's turn to the beef export front. You have two sets of numbers here, the weekly account from last week and the U.S. Meat Export Federation also just shared its April data on beef exports. What do the numbers tell us, Lee? Well, we first look at the April data, and this is the official monthly data. Beef exports were, were actually down from a volume standpoint, 6% from a year ago. They fell by value by 11%. But no, last April was very strong. So we're, we're coming down slightly from a very strong 2019 level. Overall, we're still higher than a year ago, 5%. If we look at the first four months by volume, 3% by value, really got a point to many of the trade agreements and reduction in tariffs that we've seen, the Japan trade agreement, the agreement phase one with China, um, and then many other earlier agreements that we had. You know, I think it's pretty impressive that we've still seen relative strength when you look at the weekly data. Beef exports there are still up 7%, so that suggests maybe we've seen some strength in the May data. Given the COVID-19 situation, it's not a, a U.S. situation. This has been a global pandemic, so um, I think we've seen some relative strength, at least in, in the exports, given looking at that, that weekly data. 
And the China story continues to be interesting for all the give and take between the U.S. and China over political matters. It seems that the Chinese are still in the market for agricultural products, and beef remains among those. Well, well, many of people have said it. To, to meet their phase one deal or agreement for 2020 and 2021, it's going to be have to be high-valued product. Um, and you don't get any other high-valued product than U.S. beef and pork. And so why, you know, we've seen U.S. beef exports to China up 95% so far through May. When you look at pork exports, it's up 339%. So tremendous increases there. One, they have a protein deficit there. And also this is a big part of, of meeting that phase one trade deal. So, Lee, how do you see the trading week ahead then? Will it be steady as she goes by and large? Well, I think Friday ended uh, in a bit of a, of a decline, uh, especially when you looked at, at live cattle futures. Um, you know, I think some significant negative news has, has been hitting the markets um, and just at least creating some volatility. You know, I think we're going to get a, a big kick from the improvements in, in slaughter levels. I think that's the one helping us. Uh, but also you have the box beef prices significantly declining. So that is going to impact us as well. Really, I think we've already pushed through the, the, the post Memorial Day. So now, you know, we're, we're waiting for Father's Day and uh, 4th of July um, is really the, the next big demand pulls. Um, so next week, I think we could see, you know, a little bit of weakness or, or at least hopefully a bit of steadying um, in those markets. And then hopefully we, we can get into a rally here as, as we get it more into June. All right. Good insight. And Lee, thanks for your time. And we'll talk again in a few weeks. All right. Thank you. That from Lee Schultz. Iowa State University Livestock Economist, contributing his observations on the cattle market trends. In a moment, we'll hear from a K-State veterinarian who will report to us that a highly concerning cattle reproduction disease is still very much present in Kansas and in some locations may be on the incline. That's next on Agriculture Today. For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. Agriculture Today is back now, as is K-State veterinarian Greg Hanselcheck over from the Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory here at the university, which has of late confirmed that a highly worrisome cattle reproductive disease, trichomoniasis, not only remains in Kansas, but has just recently been confirmed in cattle in additional counties in the state. From the cow-calf producer's vantage point, we can't overstate the seriousness of this condition, Greg. Absolutely, and we've done a pretty good job in Kansas for the last few years of controlling it, but since January 1st this year, we've got five counties that are positive. I'm not really sure how many herds that represents, but just in the last couple of weeks, we've had two new herds that were found to be positive in north central Kansas. So it's worthwhile, I think, to to talk a little bit about trick again and just remind everybody what it is. By the way, if one would like to know which counties are positive for trick currently, there is a way to find that out. Yeah, go to to the Diagnostic Labs website. It's uh, www.ksvdl.com. Dot org And on the left-hand side of that page, there's a button that says Disease Trends. If you click on that and then the next page, just scroll down at the bottom, there's a link that says Trick Update or Trichomoniasis Update Map. And it'll show producers where these positive counties are. Well, trichomoniasis, it's a reproductive disease, but remind us of the nature of this concern. Absolutely. And that's really the key is that this disease can only be spread. It's a venereal disease, can only be spread in the breeding act. The organism that causes it is a protozoa, so it's not a bacteria or virus. But the only way that 
a bull can become positive is if the bull breeds a cow that's positive, and the only way a cow can become infected is if she is bred by a bull that's positive. So again, it can't be spread by blood, by saliva, by tack or tires or anything. It's going to actually be the, the sexual act that causes this disease. But again, it can be the females, not just the bulls. Absolutely. We, we consider the bulls to be the major issue. They're usually the, the carriers, and, and any age of bull can be a carrier, although older bulls are probably at a higher risk. But a very, very small percentage of cows can become carriers, and so they probably do play a little bit of a role in this, in this disease. How to know that a bull or a female is carrying it? Well, it's hard to identify visually, you say. Bulls that are carriers, they you can't tell. They breed like any other bull. They chase cows around. They eat. They, they do whatever most bulls do. Females are the same way. But bulls, the only way that we can tell whether they're positive is to have the veterinarian come out and take a, a special sample and then look for that organism. We'll talk more about bull testing in a minute, but there can be clinical signs in the female which can tip one off. Absolutely, and that's we consider the clinical signs to be basically in the female. And this disease, this protozoa, it, it doesn't have any effect on conception. Meaning these animals, when they're bred by the bull, they can see the fetus starts to grow, but around 50 to 70 days of gestation, that protozoa will kill that fetus. Typically, in herds that are trick positive, what we'll find are a lot of cows that are open. And then if they have an extended breeding season, we might find another pretty good-sized group of cows that are actually pregnant, but they were pregnant towards the end of the breeding season. And that's because these cows, after they lose that fetus, will develop a very short-term, pretty strong immunity so that they, they actually will rebreed. Greg, are certain herds more prone to trick, more at risk then? Absolutely. There's major risk factors. One is uh, herds that are communal herds, herds that use the same grazing uh, area. Again, we don't have a whole lot of that in the Midwest. Southwest Kansas, we do have some communal grazing. That makes sense. The more bulls we have from different places, the the higher risk we're going to be. Another risk factor are larger herds are going to have be at a higher risk, and that's because we have more bulls. And if they're the carriers, then, then we can be more positive. But for a lot of the cases that we deal with, it's in herds that are practicing things we're not saying are necessarily wrong. It's just putting them at a higher risk of being positive, and that is either using lease bulls. And so lease bulls will be at several locations, so they have the opportunity to become infected, or herds that buy cows from unknown sources and a lot of times these cows are open when they're purchased and they might be positive already so if you're in that circumstance either a leased bull a purchased female that uh, was open when you did obtain that female why that might be a pathway to trick turning up in your herd to that bull test though and it's important as a part of prevention to have bulls test out negative for trick what's involved yeah it's a pretty simple test where the veterinarian we we consider to be non-invasive they'll just take a pipette a device and like i said collect a little bit of the oil off the outside of the penis and then and then we'll look for the organism we highly recommend that producers when they buy bulls that they either buy virgin bulls or they buy bulls that have had a negative trick test and in kansas that that's a regulation that These bulls that are sold have to have a negative test within the previous 60 days, so we highly recommend that producers do that. So testing bulls for trick, uh, other considerations on the female side, Greg? About the only thing that we can do on the female side to prevent uh, from buying females with with the disease is try to purchase cows that are at least four, if not five months pregnant, because if they're if they've made it that far in gestation, the likelihood that they're positive trick cows is very, very low. And so really our warning is purchasing open cows, you're running a risk. Cows that are mid to late gestation, you're probably going to be safe. Now, are there vaccines that can help prevent trick? And if so, what about their efficacy? There is a, actually a couple vaccines out there that are labeled for trichomoniasis control. They do not prevent infection. Uh, what they are purported to do is actually reduce the time between when an animal becomes 
infected, loses the fetus, and then, and then recycles. The effectiveness you know, are not all that great. There's a few research projects out there that have shown it will help improve pregnancy rates in positive herds. And that's kind of where we most of us recommend is that the vaccine probably is not worthwhile unless a herd is known to be positive or in herds that are known to be exposed to trick or potentially exposed to trick through neighbors or, or those kind of things. So much of this is in the protocol, if you will, of obtaining new animals. And we could talk specifically about what's required legally at sale barns that the producer should be aware of. Absolutely. The One of the regulations in Kansas today is that if a bull is brought to a sale barn and that bull does not go to slaughter, meaning that bull is intended to go back out into the, the Kansas breeding herds, that bull has to arrive with a negative trick test that was performed in the previous 60 days, meaning it's not legal for the bull to come to the sale barn and then be quarantined and tested at the sale barn, and then if negative, go out in the country. It has to be tested in the previous 60 days before arrival, and then it can go to the country if it has a negative test. That has to be adhered to very tightly to keep trick from exploding out there, right? Absolutely. That was a regulation that came about years ago, and, and it's one of the key points of uh, keeping bulls that are positive from being passed around out to our, our cow-calf operations. So I ask you this, does one need to think about testing every bull every year for trick? That's a great question. I It's up to the producer's veterinarian, but for most of us, it's probably not worth the expense or the time or the effort by the veterinarian to test every bull every year. I think for most of us, we're going to recommend testing only those bulls we think may be infected or in herds, again, that may have been exposed to trick. And we just want to make sure if those bulls are negative before we, we send them out into pasture the breeding season. And one of the important yet finer points is that if an animal does test positive in a herd, a quarantine procedure is required here. Absolutely. That's part of the one of the Kansas laws now that the producer's herd will be quarantined until the Kansas Department of Animal Health comes out and does an investigation and puts together a, a plan to make sure that the herd uh, becomes negative and make sure that they can track the positive animals. So that's one of the stipulations. And then the other one is uh, one of the regulations is if a producer becomes positive, they have to, by law, go and notify any neighbor that pastured next to their herd in that previous uh, grazing season. And that's just because, you know, fences are fences. We talk about how they're, they're great trick control systems. They're just part of the, uh, the control program. Just saying we have good fences doesn't really mean a lot. It does take a unified effort on the part of the industry. It's been around a while, suppressed, and then resurges every now and again, like you say, now affirmed in herds in five counties in Kansas. So it's going to take that diligence to keep trick at bay. Absolutely. For most of us, we believe uh, we're probably never going to get rid of trick. There's a state or two in the Midwest that uh, in the past have declared themselves trichomoniasis free and then you know, a couple of years down the road, they found out they weren't free. So I think, we, like you said, we just we need to work together. Let's abide by the regulations. Let's be good neighbors, things that we can do to control this disease. And keep, of course, your veterinarian in that loop as well. Greg, thanks for the word on this. Always appreciate it. Greg Hanselcheck from the Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory here at Kansas State University. You're listening to Agriculture Today, and we'll be back with more on the K-State Radio Network. A social distancing tip. Putting distance between yourself and others is critical to slowing the spread of coronavirus. So here are ways to stay in contact without the physical contact part. Call, send a text, set up a video conference, post on social media, dedicate a song on the radio. If you have symptoms of fever, dry cough, and shortness of breath, call your health care provider before going to their office. For more info, visit coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part, because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. You're tuned to Agriculture Today, coming to you from the campus of Kansas State University. Eric Atkinson with you, and on now to today's agricultural news headlines. These courtesy in part of DTM. 
Well, scores of soybean and cotton producers are still awaiting clarification on the dicamba rulings by that federal appeals court issued last week. To recap, a panel of judges for the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit ruled that the EPA's approval of the use of Extendamax, Ingenia, and Fexapan on an estimated 60 million acres of Extend soybeans and cotton is vacated, effective immediately, according to the ruling. That ruling only applies to the use of those three herbicides, Extendamax, Ingenia, and Fexapan, over the top of dicamba-tolerant soybeans and cotton. It's not entirely clear if the ruling applies to the use of the herbicides on other non-extend crops that may be listed on their labels. And the ruling does not apply to Syngenta's over-the-top Tavium herbicide, which was not part of the EPA's 2018 re-registration decision. There does remain confusion within the industry on if or how this court order will be enforced by state or federal pesticide regulators. The EPA has not yet informed the states or the registrants which legal steps the agency will take. In the meantime, states are announcing their own interpretations of the order with varying conclusions. The Illinois Department of Agriculture has interpreted the order to mean that all sales and uses of those herbicides are halted. The Iowa Secretary of Agriculture, Mike Neg, has said that sales and use may continue in that state until the EPA gives further instructions. Texas Agriculture Commissioner Sid Miller stated that sales and use may continue and called on the EPA to allow existing stocks of the herbicide to be used. And the University of Nebraska, in consultation with the Nebraska Department of Agriculture, published a Crop Watch article stating that the herbicides are banned for use and sale everywhere in that state. As for Kansas, no formal announcement from the Kansas Department of Agriculture yet on whether the products are legal for use and sale in the state of Kansas. By the way, on tomorrow's broadcast, we'll be visiting with K-State Weed Management Specialist Sarah Lancaster. Sarah will cover for us the alternatives to those three herbicides as the uh, status of those remain in limbo. So be tuned in tomorrow for comments from Sarah on that. The USDA, as of June the 3rd, paid out $545 million in payments via the Coronavirus Food Distribution Program, or CFAP. Of the payments, $140 million have been made for non-specialty crops, corn, soybeans, and so on, $8.5 million in specialty crops, $268 million for livestock, and $128.5 million for dairy. There have been payments made to 35,000 producers so far, according to USDA Secretary Sonny Perdue, more than 86,000 applications have been filed with the USDA. Now, the specialty crops are small, possibly because many have had no prior participation in FSA programs. But the levels for non-specialty crops could also be the unpriced inventory issue that has caused program implementers some problems. And the process with the Farm Service Agency offices being impacted by the COVID-19 issues also could be playing a role. The USDA has announced flexibilities related to crop insurance, such as deadline extensions for premium payments. Here's more on that from the USDA's Rod Main. Recent crop insurance-related deadlines, extended as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, have been extended again to assist producers. This is Risk Management Agency Administrator Martin Barbary. RMA is continuing to add more flexibilities as we get through this very difficult time. We did that quite a bit during the tough growing season we had last year, and this is just something that we continue to do. Such flexibilities include giving approved local crop insurance agents authority to extend premium payment and administrative fee deadlines for the period between May 1st and July 1st. We also added 60 days of time for those payments to be considered timely. Agents also have authority to defer resulting accrual of interest, as well as extend the correction time period related to acreage reports and other crop insurance related documentation. Additional information about recent risk management agency flexibilities can be found online at www.rma.usda.gov. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. 
Elsewhere in the headlines today, the USDA's latest trade update shows U.S. agricultural exports for the first seven months of fiscal year 2020 running just ahead of the same time frame a year ago. More on that from the USDA's Gary Crawford. The latest complete U.S. ag trade numbers available are for April, so we've got numbers for the first seven months of this fiscal year, and despite some April sales declines, our overall ag exports are still running slightly ahead of this time a year ago at $81.9 billion, up 1.1%. USDA economist and trade tracker Bart Kenner. From March to April, a few products saw increased export sales, wheat, rice, and corn, but most suffered double-digit declines for April, sending overall exports down 10 percent. Kenner says not unexpected. As much of the economy was shut down, both in the U.S. and abroad, due to restrictions to try to prevent the spread of the COVID-19 virus, that caused shifts in consumption behavior as well as disruption in supply chains combining to just have a general contraction in trade. And despite two straight months now of U.S. ag trade deficits, Kenner says we're still running a trade surplus for the year of about $3.8 billion. Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Well, here in Kansas, in the Central Plains, we've had several awfully hot days. And it's been tough on livestock. Bringing to your attention here a tool at the K-State Mesonet website that can be of assistance to you cattle producers in attempting to mitigate that heat. It's called the Cattle Comfort Index at the Weather Data Library here at K-State. It's based on the Comprehensive Comfort Index out of the University of Nebraska. And this allows a view of the impact of the extremes of both heat and cold. It's unique in that it includes, in addition to air temperature and relative humidity, the effects of wind speed and solar radiation, and the development and validation of that index use data for both beef and dairy cattle. So it indicates where current conditions fit on the scale. There's a particularly useful resource, the chart feature. It allows you to monitor how conditions have fluctuated locally over the past week. Having this feature allows you to evaluate management requirements. You can access this cattle comfort index very simply Go to mesonet.ksu.edu. That's M-E-S-O-N-E-T dot K-S-U dot E-D-U. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Jeff Wickman and this week's 4-H segment comes your way next here on the K-State Radio Network. Did you eat today? Thank a farmer. A way to get more involved in agriculture is through 4-H and FFA. Through 4-H and FFA, we have been given multiple opportunities to grow as leaders and learn more about agriculture. You can learn skills related to jobs, public speaking skills, and you get the opportunity to travel around the country and meet new people. If you want more information about getting more involved in 4-H and FFA, visit them on their websites at kansasffa.org and kansas4h.org. This is Agriculture Today. Along with Eric Atkinson, I'm Jeff Wickman. 4-H Camference is an annual event for youth ages 12 to 14 who are ready to take 4-H to the next level. The camp and conference combines games with time to talk, listen, and learn. As with many events this year, Camference is being held virtually. Southeast Area 4-H Specialist Beth Hinshaw says that youth will still participate in workshops and learn about leadership and the opportunities that lie ahead in the 4-H program. Beth, like so many things, 4-H Camference will be a little bit different this year. You'll be doing the virtual route. Yes, Jeff. You know, with everything that's happened this year, we were not able to be at Rock Springs, and and that is great sadness for us that we can't do that. But as we talked with the Youth Council, we did not want to let the summer go by without doing something. And so we're doing 4-H Camference this year in a digital format by way of Zoom, which most people probably heard of Zoom by now because so many of our young people use that to finish their school year as well. So they're at least familiar with that, which makes it good. There's also the fact that they're in that 12 to 14-year-old range, so they're used to this kind of technology. Most definitely, you know, those 12 to 14-year-olds, for the most part, are very much digital natives and probably even feel a little more comfortable with it than some of us who are helping. (laughs) The other thing that's good is you've found a way to combine the fun aspects of 4-H camp along with those learning aspects. You know, Camference has always been a really great blend of the fun of 4-H camp, 
but also because these young people are 12 to 14, transitioning some of that over into some leadership and other type of work as well. And the great thing is, is that we're going to be able to do that in this new format too. Talk a little bit about some of the fun things that you're still able to bring, even virtually. One of the things that'll happen with the kids who come to Camference this year is that they'll get a packet in the mail with everything that they need for Camference. And, you know, I don't know about you, but I love fun mail. And so we think that that'll be kind of the one thing that just kicks it off. Like, oh my goodness, you know, here's my camp supplies. So, you know, we're going to do an opening ceremony just like camp. We're going to have line dance lessons like we would have at camp. We're going to have a talent show like camp. We're even going to have s'mores uh, like we would probably have at the camp campfire. Those better be real s'mores and not virtual s'mores. No, they'll be real. (laughs) (laughs) Otherwise, you might have a revolt on your hands. Right. Another piece is that we will also um, have a camp craft. Normally, this would be a three-day event. How will you do it virtually? You know, that was one of the things that was really important to us to think about what makes sense this year. If we were going to conference in a regular year, we would have kind of pieces of four days and three overnights. But what we'll be doing is we'll be focusing on Tuesday, June the 23rd and Wednesday, June the 24th. And on that Tuesday, we'll have an hour and a half session in the afternoon and a two-hour session in the evening. And then on that Wednesday, we'll have two hours in the morning and two hours in the afternoon. We know people only have so much attention span, even if we're doing all kinds of fun things. You know, you have to be realistic about how long people can really be on a device and what makes sense. It'll be very well laid out, you know, as to when to log on and how and where and the different things that will be happening each day. You know, I mentioned a lot of those fun things we're going to do, but one of the kind of, you know, pushing you into some leadership and learning some new things is we will be having a community conversation as a part of Camference. And then we're also partnering with the Kansas 4-H Foundation and learning a little bit about philanthropy as well. So we think we have a really well-rounded program with that fun of camp and also some really great learning opportunities to take people forward. So this is all set up by the 4-H Leadership Council, and you mentioned that they're fully on board with this and they came up with a lot of the ideas? Oh, yes. This is one of the committees that the Youth Leadership Council has every year, and all of them have gone through all kinds of adversity this year. You know, when you think about their school year ended early and had to be, you know, finalized a different way. Some of them have missed graduations and proms and other things, and we've been so proud of them because they have not really skipped a beat. You know, they've said, you know what, it's important to do something this summer, and the closer we get to the event, uh, we're having a weekly committee meeting right now, and they're getting really excited about what's happening. So who should register for this? Camference is for young people who are ages 12 to 14, and the registration information is on the Kansas 4-H website, kansas4h.org, and it's right under what's hot. I think it's the first thing. The registration fee is $20 per person, and you'll pay that to your local extension office. Our deadline is June the 12th or until all the spots are filled. You know, sometimes you'd think, oh, well, with a digital format, you know, you can just take as many people as you want. But we do want to be very intentional about the numbers of people and how you're able to, to interact. How much have you learned during this COVID restructuring? You know, my joke is, hey, I've learned something else new today. So, you know, I think all of us have learned how does the Zoom technology work a little bit better. A lot of the things, you know, have been related to software or platforms that we have available through K-State Research and Extension. But it does really feel like that there's been some new learning every single day. Well, and I think it's been important that 4-H has been able to continue to serve the youth because that's their mission. Most definitely. And I've been so proud of what our K-State Research and Extension staff across Kansas have done and have found, you know, ways to reach their young people and to see they've 
encouraged them to do service. They've encouraged them, you know, to really be working on their projects while they were home a little bit more and finding interesting ways through video and interviews to share their projects so that other people can learn about it. And again, 4-H Conference, another way to have fun and learn at the same time. Definitely. And we sure hope that young people will consider signing up. The one nice thing about this is, you know, not only are you going to see kids from your own 4-H club or your own county or district, but you're going to, you know, meet some people from across the state as well. That's Southeast Area 4-H Specialist Beth Hinshaw. Again, for more information about Camference, visit Kansas4H.org. Registration is open until June 12th or until all spots are filled. And that'll do it for this edition of Agriculture Today. For Eric Atkinson, I'm Jeff Wickman. This is the K-State Radio Network.